Okay, everyone, I think now is as good a time as any to begin. Um, so thank you all for coming to our talk today. My name is Max Horder. I'm a research fellow at EyesGap uh, here, and I'm really incredibly excited to introduce our speaker for today, Fane Rosenbaum. Uh, so before I introduce our speaker, just a little bit about the series that we're running that this uh, talk is part of. So this is a series called The, Ant the Intersectionality of Antisemitism. And it's des described as follows. Given the global pervasiveness of antisemitism, its online presence and related inroads into the mainstream, there may, no, there may be no greater challenge for scholars of antisemitism than to reconsider our assumptions about who antisemites are, where, and how they mobilize. This 12 part series of seminars, six in the fall and six in the spring, interrogates the identities antisemites presumably possess, the ideological positions they prefer, and the places they inhabit. So that's the series. I'm delighted to announce, to, to give the biography of our speaker today. Fane Rosenbaum is a novelist, essayist, law professor, and distinguished university professor at Toro College, where he directs the Forum on Life, Culture, and Society. His articles, reviews, and essays appear frequently in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, Los Angeles Times, CNN, the Daily Beast, and other national publications. He serves as the legal analyst for CBS News and moderates the talk show at 92nd Street Y, an annual series on culture, world events, and politics. He has been invited to give public lectures around the world and is distinguished university professor um, uh, and, and the author of Payback, The Case for Revenge, The Myth of Moral Justice, Why Our Legal System Fails to Do What's Right, and is the editor of the anthology Law Lit, From Atticus Finch to the Practice, a collection of great writing about the law. He's also published five novels, including The Golems of Gotham and Secondhand Smoke. And with that, um, just before we begin, I would, we're going to be um, putting some people on as panellists. I would encourage everyone to turn on their cameras just so we have kind of more of a sense of engagement. And at the end of the talk, I will be taking questions. Please, if you have a question until then, pop it in the chat and I'll write it. If not, we'll go around and ask questions at the very end. So thanks so much, Thane. Uh, thank you, Max. <clears throat> Welcome everyone from uh, ISGAP. <clears throat> I'm a longtime fan of Charles Osher Small um, and clearly what he does and what this organization does is essentially God's work. Um, so, of course, one would not refuse a request to speak to this audience. And thank you all for joining me this morning. <clears throat> the series, I understand, is about intersectionality. I've been asked to speak about uh, the state of American culture uh, and intersectionality and the declining Jewish influence in American culture. Um, this is, these remarks are largely based on a, a longer form essay that I published over the summer and a new Jewish magazine called Sapir, S-A-P. I R. It's uh, edited by uh, Brett Stevens from the New York Times, and this, uh, this, if you're interested in what I'm saying today, there's a much larger version of it in the summer issue, the second issue of Sapir. Um, well, culture, American culture, it is, it is now a, a closed culture, not an open one. Um, in many ways, intersectionality is is incompatible with the creation of culture, any culture. Um, uh, you're dealing with a culture that defines itself so much nowadays by the, its cancellation powers. The canceling of culture is the very opposite of the creation of culture. Culture requires tolerance, acceptance, enrichment. And what we have now is a culture through intersectionality and critical race theory of grievance uh, and reprimand and intolerance and humorlessness and bitterness uh, these, these are not the, the qualities that generate and gender culture. Um, uh, uh, and so therefore the, you, could, you could properly say that this is a, we're experiencing a cultural crisis that's very much linked to the culture wars. Uh, the culture wars about today is focused on taking offense, finding safe spaces, uh, avoiding microaggressions, and it's a fundamental attack against liberalism, the openness of liberalism. Uh, the culture has narrowed and everyone is capitulating to this. That's what's most troubling. Hollywood studios, publishing houses, newspapers, art museums. Uh, the, 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 uh, the object, as far as I can tell, is to avoid being politically incorrect. 
The focus is not on aesthetics. It's not what's good. It's what won't offend. Uh, and so that's why it's, it's so intolerant, intolerant, intolerant and humorless. It's also an attack on the melting pot, which is something that is so familiar to Jews. The, the goal of an American simulation, the immersion in the broader uh, American culture. Uh, it's a fundamental attack on that. Uh, and, and instead it's focused entirely on identity, which I, I will get to in a moment. So it's illiberal, it's Orwellian in the language that it uses, microaggressions, uh, you know, long standing examples of white supremacy, systemic racism. These are all sort of the terms of art. You know, you hear President Biden repeat the word systemic racism endlessly. I'm sure he doesn't know what it means. Uh, there's no systemic racism in the United States. I'm a law professor. I, we can get into that if you want, but it's just, it's utter, it's preposterous. That's what the uh, Emancipation Proclamation and the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment uh, achieved and, and the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act and uh, re uh, regulations promoting uh, uh, public uh, uh, rights in housing and, and in public accommodations. If there's racism, it's a racism that lingers within the heart of people. It's not in the system. Yes, there are still people that, and by the way, speaking as an American Jew, there's anti-Semitism, which will not go away either. And it's not systemic. It, no one talks about systemic anti-Semitism. It's an anti-Semitism that just, it lives in the hearts of people. And that's something that, you know, this world, this new world of reprimand and grievance is intended to eliminate all racism, which is going to be a, 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 a heavy load to achieve. Um, so uh, it's a puritanical wokeism. Um, we saw so much of this in connection with the Tom Cotton uh, op-ed that was withdrawn from the New York Times, an op-ed from a United States Senator was not just withdrawn, but there was great apology for the actual publication of an opinion that 63% of Americans actually agreed with, right? These things are just bizarre. And again, this is what we're seeing in mainstream culture. It's not just group think, it's right think that what we're being told in a moralizing way that there's only one way to think. Uh, and, any, any, and any thought other than the right think is racism. Um, social justice is much more focused over aesthetics. Well, culture doesn't come from social justice. It comes from aesthetics. Shouting down speakers, something that we're seeing much more widely in universities, but elsewhere. There's recent studies that show a shocking number of American college students think that it's not only appropriate to shout down speakers, but in some instances to resort to violence, to silence them. This is, this is not a country that understands what the First Amendment means, right? The, the idea of artistic liberties, the idea of liberty and freedom of speech, uh, you know, the idea that we would be shouting down speakers, disinviting speakers, resorting to violence against speakers. Why? We we'll simply disagree with what they have to say, right? That is not an America that, uh, that the founding fathers sought to create. They were interested in a marketplace of ideas, a public square where people came to the village greens and the public squares got up on a soapbox and, and presented their ideas for the day. Uh, and with the hope that through representative democracy, better decisions would be made, the government would be better informed and there'd be a better informed citizens electorate. Today, we're being told shouting down speakers is appropriate. Why? Well, there's so much you know, brainwashing self-censorship, uh, censorship within the publishing industry, uh, the self-censorship for people who are just simply afraid to speak. And this leads to a, uh, uh, no culture can survive such suffocations. It's an impoverishment of ideas and art. Now, as, as for Jews, the declining influence of Jews, let me just say, <laughs> without any hesitation, Jews are immigrants to the United States, but they're indigenous to American culture. There is no American culture without Jews. Let me repeat that again. There's simply no American culture without Jews. Uh, and to, to minimize that, to rush, to move away from that, to pretend that it's not true, is, 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 is a disservice to the, the contribution that Jews 
have made to enriching the life, the cultural life, and the life of the mind of the American public. Uh, wherever Jews have been in Western societies that offer liberal cultures, uh, Jews have made, the, made their countries more interesting um, uh, and, and enriched it in every way possible. Um, uh, and, and, and it comes from the creative imagination and the intellectual energy of Jews. Uh, cinema, song, theater, literature, comedy, intellectual magazines, all of these industries were dominated uh, by Jewish voices, Jewish intellectual energy, Jewish imagination. Uh, once the barriers to entry were lifted, uh, once Jews were uh, permitted to enter mainstream culture, uh, they unleashed, uh, you know, this extraordinary amount of uh, imaginative energy. Um, and a, a kind of Jewish sensibility became American culture, creative, wry, ribald, original thinking, right? The, 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 the willingness to engage in debate, openness and acceptedness to difference, uh, ultimately became part of Jewish life in mainstream culture. Jews for centuries were looking in to culture, and once they were permitted within the mainstream culture, their capacity to look out of that culture created a kind of perfect storm of what culture would end up, would end up being with that both insider and outsider's uh, perspective. Um, Yiddish theater begot Broadway, begot Hollywood, the American songbook. Uh, Irving Berlin wrote White Christmas, Easter Parade, and God Bless America. That's a Jewish guy. Uh, the entire American songbook, Gershwin, Hammerstein, Oscar Rogers and Hammerstein, Rogers and Hart, Sondheim, Bob Dylan, the very first uh, uh, songwriter to win a Nobel Prize, Prize for Literature, Carol King, for the love of God, you can't go to a sporting event anymore without hearing Sweet Caroline, you know, Neil Diamond song, uh, you know, and that was written for Caroline Kennedy <laughs> when he was inspired by this Life magazine photo of her after her father was assassinated. How deeply American a, a, a concept of that is contribution that a Jewish Americans made to Jewish, uh, to American culture. Uh, the New York Times was resurrected by Jews. Um, uh, the, the, the American novel was sort of reimagined and reinvented by Jews. The post-war era of Saul Bellows, uh, Bernard Malamud, Philip Roth, Cynthia Ozick, uh, you know, Norman Mailer, the, the, the way in which Jewish life penetrated uh, the broader culture. I'm seeing uh, Max, Max Murray Rubin is in a large box and I'm nowhere. I, does anyone know why that is? I don't mind looking at Murray, but Murray is enlarged on my screen. Um, Max, do you hear me? I just want to make sure Max heard. I hear oh. you. Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now uh, you're on. I, I was enlarged and then I was what El Shade said. And now it's all right. I just wanted you, hey, to, you know. have to. You have to click the view. There's a box. There it says the change your view where you can see everybody. Yeah, well, that was where it was. That's where I had it. And somehow I don't want to see everyone. I want to see, I already do see everybody. Okay, in any event, um, uh, uh, where am I? Okay, intellectual magazines. Uh, so, so Max, now I only see you in large. Um, the, uh, the New Yorker magazine, the Partisan Review, Commentary, The New Republic, Dissent, founded by Jews, edited by Jews for, for the last 60, 70 years. Uh, uh, observational and political humor, right? Humor left the world of slapstick and shtick and moved into something that was more intellectual and observational. You know, Mort Saul just died, I think this week or a week before. Lenny Bruce, uh, Jackie Mason, who died. I wrote an essay for the uh, Jewish uh, JTA when he died. Uh, who, by the way, who eventually became deemed politically incorrect. Uh, comedians today are afraid to appear at universities. They don't go to colleges because they know that the world of offense and insult is a, macro, is a microaggression and it's pointless to go there. They'll be shouted down. American style, the blue jeans, Levi Strauss, a Jewish merchant went in 1849 to San Francisco to help 
you know, built to, to sell tents, canvas material for people who were mining for gold. And he figured out those tents would make interesting pants. Uh, the Western look, uh, the preppy look is Ralph Lauren. His real name is, is, is uh, Ralph Lipschitz. And uh, he, was, he went to a, a Jewish day school in Brooklyn, right? That is a signature American look that comes from a Jewish sensibility and style. The Hollywood movies, five of the six original studio chiefs were all Jews. MGM is uh, Louis B. Mayer, uh, the, Carl Lemley at Universal Studios, Warner Brothers. That means that the cowboy Western was in, essentially invented by people who probably never rode a horse, right? But that's literally what was a, for many years an American export right, the Hollywood Western. Comic book writers today, unfortunately, make up what we see in most of our movies, but they were all, the original comic book writers for both Marvel and DC were Jews. Uh, and where does that come from? Well, a fantasy about rescue, right? Looking for the superhero to, to rescue your people. Abstract expressionism, right? Um, cultures need openness. Uh, they need liberalism. And Jews have historically thrived in liberal culture, where there's a generosity of spirit, there's an acceptance of different ideas. Uh, Allen Ginsberg composed the poem Howl, which really was a, you know, a man of, a, an expression of gay love and brought it into mainstream consciousness. Again, acceptance, the acceptance that comes from liberalism. Uh, what is Jewish culture is liberal culture. They, they are synonymous with each other. Uh, and they derive from American core beliefs that are very much out of fashion nowadays. Uh, the unparalleled freedom of the United States, its fairness, its focus on individual merit. As you know, critical race theory is against individual merit. It's really in focus, a very different objective, the objective of equity, which I should get to in a second. Uh, the ability to take a joke, for God's sakes, right? If you can't take a joke, you can't actually participate in meaningful culture. And of course, the First Amendment, the fundamental understanding of the freedom of expression, whether it's artistic or, or, or the, the expression of ideas. The First Amendment, uh, from, the, from the perspective of the, the world of intersectionality, is anti-woke uh, because the First Amendment leads to insult. The First Amendment leads to offense. And so therefore, the First Amendment is not something that can be embraced. These are uh, Western values that are inimical to an intersectional uh, universe. Um, one thing is sure that if a society lets Jews be Jews, and if Jews are not afraid to be Jews, interesting things happen. And that's been true in Western societies all throughout the world. Um, but instead, we are now living in a time where uh, there is less openness to difference uh, and that there is no, there's no value in the skill to disagreement because you're not allowed to disagree. Um, similarly, the fo endless focus on misappropriation or cultural appropriation, this idea that one cannot fictionalize the lives of others, especially another, a, a minority. You can't create dialogue in the voice of another minority. Uh, you can't reimagine the lives of other people. You can't write dialogue in their voices. This essentially is a demonization of empathy and imagination. And it's a fundamental misunderstanding of how ideas are brought to life and how art is made. Uh, art requires that the imagination be free so that the person can observe widely and inhabit other worlds uh, and reassemble the pieces in a different way. But if you're not permitted to speak in the voice of another, I mean, you can imagine what wouldn't be per permitted to be published today, right? Because the, uh, the, the idea that one could not write in the voice of another minority group, because essentially it then becomes stolen material. Again, a fundamental misunderstanding and a, 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 a complete misappreciation of how ideas are launched and how art, uh, art is made. This endless obsession with equity, which is about equal outcomes. It's not about opportunity. Again, there's something you know, fundamentally 
illiberal about that idea, right? This, this idea that what we need to achieve is pure equal outcomes as opposed to providing equal opportunities. And also inclusiveness. This is where the language of identity comes up so much. Um, because inclusiveness need, means that you have to somehow represent the voices of different races, ethnicity, sexuality, and gender, right? But when you're representing identity, that's not about aesthetics. That's not about excellence. Uh, you know, that the idea here is if you're representing identity, that your, your goal is not the creation of art. It's the creation of, of identity. Art is about creation, not representation. Uh, art that is purely about representing identity is derivative art. It's mediocre art. It's the art of woke culture. It's the, the, the end of American cultural life, frankly, uh, woke art, because, of, because it's so mediocre, because it's so derivative, because it's so tedious, because it's about, you know, and it's essentially anti-culture because its focus is about representations of identities and not about aesthetics. Um, Jewish stories in particular are particularly out of fashion today. Uh, the Holocaust, there was a professor at Oberlin who said that the Holocaust shouldn't even be taught in universities because it's white on white crime. It doesn't count, it's white against white. And the only crime that matters is crimes against people of color. Um, identity politics, interestingly, does not apply to Jews. For all of the focus on identity, Jewish identity is irrelevant. And it's not because Jews are no longer involved in the creation of culture in the United States. That's not, it's worse than that, they are. The problem is that they, they live in cultural institutions, but they downplay their Jewishness. They're living scared. They're utterly scared of offending someone. Uh, certainly offend, uh, of, of in presenting Jewish art, um, uh, they have to demonstrate their social justice bona fides. They have to demonstrate that they're, they're, they're completely on board with Black Lives Matter and its anti-Israel message. Uh, there was, you know, this endless focus. I, I was just quoted about eight months ago, maybe a year ago, the, the Holocaust Museum in uh, Orlando, Florida, had a, an exhibit on George Floyd. You know, just, I just, it's outrageous. No, George Floyd, no matter what you think of him, his story does not belong in a Holocaust museum. It simply trivializes the genocide of a people, utterly trivializes it. And instead what we have is this focus to demonstrate the social justice bona fides and so that's why you're seeing in publishing, in museums, in newspapers, in Hollywood, in music, this focus on identity and equity. And again, with, with respect to Jewish artists, they feel a, an obligation to prove that they're anti-Israel. Uh, I wrote an essay recently for, I write a bi-monthly column for the Jewish Journal in Los Angeles. So if you look on that, you'll see I wrote a recent column about uh, Sarah Silverman coming to this extraordinary re re realization for the first time after years of bashing Israel, that people are only interested in Jews when they're suffering. Yes, Sarah, how did you just discover this now? But we're seeing people like the, you know, the, I, I don't know if you call him a comedian or an actor, Seth Rogen, he doesn't seem to me to be funny or much of an actor, but you know, his recent comments about that he had been lied to in Canada about Israel's story. Uh, you know, this is supposed to win points. Natalie Portman refused to go back to Israel where she was born to accept an award because she wanted to demonstrate her protest against Israel. Uh, John Stewart and his, his coverage of in his show when he had The Daily Show of Gaza, if you remember that, you know, his, his mocking of Israel's moral dilemma uh, in defending its nation was just it was just gross, right? But 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 it's you know it's fashionable for a Jewish artist uh, to take that position. Look, Jews have a lot of sweat equity in American culture, and it shouldn't be so casually squandered or surrendered. It's it's time, I think, uh, for Jews in particular uh, to stop apologizing for being white or apologizing for loving Israel. 
or uh, or or per, or saying that their Jews benefit from white privilege. I, I don't know any Jews are never given anything unless they've earned it. I just don't see where that's happened. Not on this planet. People just don't give Jews something because they're white. Uh, but this is the new the new language, the new fashion is for Jews to blame themselves. It's their fault. I heard recently from uh, one some uh, Hollywood. Uh, um, you know, Macher, so to speak, <laughs> who there was a meeting during the Black Lives Matter movement where Jewish leaders of various entertainment industries and art uh, industries got on a conference call, a Zoom call like this together. And it was led by a senior member of the Hollywood Jewish establishment. The first words out of his mouth were, I didn't realize until Black Lives Matter that I am evil. This is not the words of a Jewish man. Jewish men should not say this. I'm not going to give you the name of this person, but he should be embarrassed. Evil? Really? You're evil. Jews are evil. And you just made this realization, right? This idea of this world of self-censorship and apology for being Jewish for being, and for being white. Um, the, a world of identity is a world that thwarts reinvention especially the world of American reinvention. So I'm, I'm coming up, I guess, to the end of my time. I understand that Max wants to uh, curate uh, a, a conversation with us, and I'm happy to have that. I'm sure I give you a lot to think about. Some of you will probably object to what I've said. That's good too. You know why? Because that's, that's okay in a liberal society. <laughs> I'm able to hear this without offense. Um, I want to end with Joseph Stalin because he was on to something. You may remember that among the many things he was very famous for, or infamous for, was a term of art called the rootless cosmopolitans. And he was specifically referring to Jews. Uh, these were in his mind, a people without identity, right? He used that word, a people without identity. Notice the word identity pops up. Uh, these were people who had a passport for wandering and that they couldn't be trusted to be Soviets, to be true communists. And he was especially, remember this was during the purges of the Stalinist era. He was after, it wasn't just the doctor, Jewish doctor's trial. He was after the poets, the artists, the Yiddish speakers, the Zionists, and he killed a lot of them. And he killed a lot of them because they were rootless cosmopolitans, Jews, Jew, and he was after Jewish intellectuals, Western bourgeois values, now notice critical race theory makes no uh, apology for the fact that it derives its essential thinking from Marxism. It, it's no surprise. Uh, and similarly, guess what? Critical race theory, intersectionality is focused on identity and is focused against cosmopolitans. And that's where Jews have been. In Western worlds, Jews have inhabited the cosmopolitan life. In fact, Jews are really good at being cosmopolitans. It's probably what we do best. And if you provide Jews with a liberal society uh, with unparalleled freedoms and open up culture to a cosmopolitan world, the very thing that Stalin was afraid of because it would make people not accept the group think of communism not allow themselves to be brainwashed and indoctrinated. This is why he hated Jews, why they were the rootless cosmopolitans. Well, I I'm saying this is something that Jews should own. We should be owning the idea that we are not focused entirely on identity, whether it be racial or ethnic or gender or sexual. We're interested in ideas and we're interested in the creation of art and culture and open-mindedness and tolerance. Um, and so we, Stalin knew what he, was, what he wanted to eliminate. And it's, it's just enormously interesting when people say, oh, there's really no connection between Black Lives Matter and communism. Are you kidding, right? The, the critical race theory, the, its oxygen is Marxism. It derives fundamentally from critical theory. Um, and so it's not surprising that what you see today, the focus and identity which is an attack on liberal culture itself, is ultimately attack on liberalism and cosmopolitanism, which is just so happened something that Jews have excelled at. 
All right, I hope that was interesting. Max, I send it back to you. I think I was Thank right so on time. 30 it's minutes. On time. It's perfectly on time. Thank you so much. Fascinating talk, really incredible. Very, very interesting. I'm gonna, so in terms of, we've got a few questions in the chat. So before I ask anyone who wants to raise their hand, I'm gonna, I'm gonna read these out first, uh, just because they, they posted them before. So there's a few here. So the first one is from Deborah. And her question is, would you agree that the groundwork for much of the current behaviors was laid by the progressive left anti-Semite slash anti-Zionist, who learned that shouting down and canceling Zionist speakers on college campuses was acceptable and would not be sanctioned? and that these practices have now spread through the wider community. Yeah. So do you see well, a historical link there? Yeah, I absolutely do. That, Deborah's absolutely right, the le left's attack on Zionism. But again, so too was Stalin, right? Stalin saw Zionism as cosmopolitan. <laughs> he treated it in that way. But the other attack, Deborah's right, and the other attack, I think its origins is, people forget this from the 1980s, early 1980s, when we first started hearing the words, the politics of identity, political correctness, that was when the language was first developed. You heard this, the, the language of the attack of the, uh, the, the, the idea of the Western canon, white books written by old white men. This started really in the 1980s, right? That these books were not the great books. They were, the Western canon were not written by great, and that it, the, and the reason we know this is because there are no people of color, there's no different genders represented. And although that was probably true, the, the complete lack of any representation, you see a full swing today. Today, there's only two universities that teach the great white books, the Western canon. They're too afraid to do that. Today, you see all sorts of courses in, you know, not just in politics, but in literature and in art, you know, gay art, uh, uh, feminist art, uh, 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 Latin X art, right? You see the idea of the over-representation of identity. And that goes to the point that I said before, that, that art that's focused on identity is interested only in mediocrity. It has to be interested in aesthetics, not just representation. But that first started in the 1980s with the attack of the Western canon and the, the great books of the white men. That, in, that was introduced then, and now we've gone full circle. Now the books of the white men aren't taught at all. They're just considered racists. Fantastic, thank you very much. Um, got a, um, well, let me ask Charles actually. We've got some written down, but Charles has got his hand up. Um, so maybe we'll just, Charles, would you like to ask a question? Yeah, uh, Thane, yeah, great talk. I, uh, Thanks, Charlie. Thank you. Uh, I think the question I have, Thane, is that you have a shrinking Jewish community that basically is not aligned with Jewish values, not aligned with Israel, and no longer coherent. So how can one expect, and no leadership, and no longer having the assimilation is growing. And the Pew study is telling many people that the Jewish community is shrinking rapidly. So how can these cultural factors be reversed in the context of these factors? Thing? Well, let me just say a few things about that, Charlie. I, look, I'm, I'm pretty cynical about this. So your question isn't directed to the right guy per se, because I, I agree with you. It's all very distressing, disheartening. Um, I do think a few things. There are cultural institutions, cult Jewish magazines, Jewish newspapers, Jewish publishing houses, and Jews need to start supporting them. It's time to be supporting Jewish institutions. Yeah, cancel your subscription to the New York Times. It's a waste of time. By the way, I haven't done it yet, but I'd like to. Um, I feel like I'm in the business and I need access to them, but they don't deserve you. And so if you're going to write a check, write a check to the Jewish publishers, Jewish magazines, Jewish newspapers, Jewish theater, Yiddish theater. I know Charlie's involved in that. Right. So there, there are ways to, so I think that these things need to be won in small battles. Look, Jews, as you heard me say, in a, in a very unapologetic way, basically are responsible for so much of what is American culture. But we were always a minority. 
it's always shocking when you think about that. How did Jews actually have that much of an impact on American culture, given how few of them there were? So I think that, you know, it's getting worse, Charlie, as you're right, it's getting worse. But I have no doubt if you let Jews be Jews, and if Jews are not embarrassed to be Jews, really cool things happen. Great things happen. And I think that that's really what we need to do. I don't know whether we can ever reclaim the numbers. I don't know whether we can ever have the kind of social or communal cohesion that would you know, satisfy a Charlie Rose or a Thane Rosenbaum, probably not. But Jews will always be here. Uh, but one way to, to, is to, to basically be so against what it means to be Jewish and to, to, to capitulate to the idea that Jewishness, Jewish sensibility needs to be hidden rather than be projected. I'd only like to make one follow-up point, Thane, and that is that it may be that the center of Jewish life in America is shrinking so rapidly that it may be that the center of all these issues becomes Israel and not America. Well, you know, if you would have said to me, Charlie, a year, two years ago, that there would be Jews beaten on the streets on the Diamond District, uh, Broad Times Square, uh, Fairfax Pico in Los Angeles, Bell Harbor in Miami, even me with, you know, this profound sem, I'm child of Holocaust survivors, as you well know, Charlie, even someone like me would say, you're out of your mind. In the United right. States, Jews were going to be beaten on the streets in the Diamond District. It's almost a, it would be too absurd. Um, so I, 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 would, I would have always thought my, my good friend, Daniel Goldhagen, uh, his last book on anti-Semitism, you know, talked about, well, it may be that the only place that Jews are both safe and able to be Jews will be the United States and Israel. I don't know if he would have said that today. I don't know if he would have said just Israel. Good. Thank you, Sam. Thank you very much. Um, Andrea, did you have your hand up as well? Uh... Thank you. Um, two things. Uh, first of all, I thought the list of uh, Jewish contributions was amazing. And I just wanted to add one that the woke should think about. The first gay marriages were Jews. Yes. Right? Yes. Uh, yes. To, but, but remember, the Jews that had any Jewish identi identification, whether it's uh, Stars of David or the Israeli flag, were kicked out of the Dyke March and yes. the gay march in Chicago and in DC. Just right. so- Subsequent, for, that's right. For, right, for, for all of that contribution to gay marriage, they're not allowed to march anymore in gay parades. Right, so um, two, two questions. One is you spoke about Jewish influence being so dominant and I'm wondering if that concept is part of the problem. People see us as m maybe smaller numbers but hugely overrepresented in the arts and culture. And my other question, I'll jump in, is that while Jews have thrived in open societies, isn't it also true that contributions by Jews are extraordinary and out of proportion in Islamic cultures, which were much more closed? Uh, I, you know, that I don't know the answer to that, the second question. I don't. I, I find it, um, yeah, I don't know how dominant they were. I can't imagine because they were closed, right? Because Jews existing in Islamic societies, be precisely to me, it seems like if in fact they didn't create art, it's it's a it is you know exhibit A to what happens when Jews are restrained versus when Jews are you know uh, unleashed. Um, but I would say, look, yeah, I, I, you know there may be some resentment. Remember, a lot of these <laughs> Jewish contributions were made by people who changed their names you know, who did not in openly think of themselves, you know, Carol King didn't write Jewish songs per se, right? Nor did her husband who was Jewish, right? I mean, you know, uh, there, there has always been a reticence among, I think, the, the Jewish community to not be so openly Jewish, right? To be too Jewish. So I think that there was always a sensitivity, uh, rightly or wrongly, to not being in your face Jewish. Um, but, but to submerge one's Jewish identity, 
to, to submerge their Jewish sensibility for fear that it will cause resentment. Again, that's just not the America that I know, and it's not what liberalism means. Liberalism is focused not on equity, but on individual merit. And Jews have historically thrived in societies that took away quotas and let Jews race in the race without shackles, right? And so that's why, again, this focus on inclusiveness, right, creates tediousness and derivative art because it's not about aesthetics. It becomes only about the representation of identity and no good art derives from that. And, and, and similarly, you know, the closeness the, uh, of, of, of a culture also brings you no art. You have to create the environment uh, where people can to uh, truly express their creative freedom. Thank you. Fantastic. I've got a, uh, a question here from Robin that says, I'm wondering if Stain has any thoughts on the direction of Jewish votes going forward. Does he think there is a possibility we will see a shift that Jews might begin to move to the right? Or is that a hopeless hope? You know, again, I'm often wrong. So people should not listen listen to me. Uh, you know, I, I'm often wrong. Um, uh, I'm of the view that, you know, whatever Kool-Aid Jews have been drinking since the New Deal, they can't vote Republican. I don't know why they can't vote Republican. I'm a registered Democrat. I can't even ask myself that, right? For the love of God, I'm so disgusted by my party. <laughs> so, you know, why am I still a registered Democrat? Because I am. So I'm not sure that Jews are ever going to change their party affiliation. I do think this, and this goes back to the point that Charlie Rose made a moment ago, Jews are simply diluting themselves into non-existence through intermarriage. They're just simply doing that. And it may be that the only group of Jews that are simply growing is the religious Jew. Religious Jews are simply having larger families, and they actually understand what Jewish continuity really means. And they haven't been brainwashed into something as stupid as tikkun olam, which, you know, this endless chanting of tikkun olam has been, you know, really the death knell of our people. Because even though I am not a religious Jew, I think somebody needs to be reading the Torah and someone else, we need fewer people who think that it means Jewish to be, in, to be on the social action committee in your synagogue. You need more Jews not to think that's what it means to be Jewish. Because what Jews think tikkun olam means is never to be interested in myself or my people. <laughs> Only to show my moral superiority, my moral narcissism, my virtue signal to say, look at me, look at me. I hate Israel. I hate Israel and I love to march in Black Lives Matter's marches. Look at me. Look how special I am. I wrote about this years ago. It's, it's, a, it's a, I call it moral narcissism. Look at me. Look at me. I hate my people. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know if the voters are going to change. I just don't. I just know that the, what, what we will see is the Jews that are voting for Republicans are going to be increasingly uh, devout religious Jews. Fantastic. Um, very interesting. Uh, I've got a question here from, um, well, it sort of ties back to the last question, actually. This one's from Susan. So she says, Jews in academia and the arts conform to wokeism to maintain their status and power. But Jews who are allegedly in positions of leadership in the Jewish community are also woke. They even create new organizations to allegedly represent the Jewish community and voice wokeism. So similar to what you're saying about Tikkun Olam. But the question is then, do you think they're all just self-perpetuating phonies or do you think they really believe in wokeism? You know, I think 2000 years of exile created a people that just want to be loved. Too many of them. You know, they want to be embraced. They want to be popular. They want their neighbors to like them. And they mistakenly believe that this is how you do it, by showing that you hate yourself, by showing that you hate Israel, by demonstrating. They don't understand that that's exactly what the people who hate Jews want to see. That's where they got you where they want you, right? Where they've got you to hate yourself. Instead of showing a sense of Jewish pride, saying, look, 
I have completely diluted myself into non-existence. So I do think some of it is just about, look, let me just, I say this all the time jokingly, but I'm not joking. In the world that I inhabit, nobody would want to be me. Who would want to be me, right? Every university until recently that I've been at, thank God for Turo College, where I am now. Thank God for Dr. Alan Kadish, who rescued me from NYU. Who would want to be me at NYU? Who would want to be me at Fordham? Nobody. Who would want to be me who wrote for the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Los Angeles Times? I'm, I'm anthrax in the, in the cultural world. A pro-Israel, avowedly Jewish writer who doesn't hate himself and doesn't hate his people? Who'd want to be me, right? My, the invitation list for parties for Thane Rosenbaum is much less. As I've said for many years, it's a way better career move to be Peter Beiner. Or, 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 you know, it's just that that community is large for a reason. There's a reason why there's a handful of guys like me and women like me, and everyone else is somewhere else. There, are, It's the reason why Jewish academics in universities, even the ones that would agree with anything that I would say, keep their head down. They keep their head down. You know why? Life is short. Life is short. When I go to the faculty lounge, I want people to talk to me. That's what they think. I want fruit cup. Because then I know that if I go to a faculty lounge, the first thing I need to say, they say, Israel is the greatest human rights violator in the history of the world, worse than the Huns, worse than the Nazis, and then the Jews get free, then you get fruit cup at a faculty lounge. That's how you get it. And if you don't say that, if you don't repeat that, when you walk into the faculty lounge, forget the fruit cup. It's not happening. So back to, I don't know if the word is phonies, but I'll tell you this endless desire for ex social acceptance, right? Even to the point of a self-abasement, self-embarrassment is something that I have found to be increasingly American and Jewish American. Whether it's phony or not, I don't know, but I think that they, in the end, they make a calculation. Life is a lot better if I just simply keep my mouth shut and say a couple things that people want to hear me say. Trump is evil, Netanyahu is evil, Israel is the worst, you, you know, is, is Israel trains cops to kill black people. Where did, where do you get this? Israel is targeting Palestinian children. Where do you get this? How can a Jew say things like this? You know, Israel learned from the Nazis. Who, who talks like this? And, and this is unfortunately what you hear. This is what you hear on the word apartheid, really apartheid. Israel has an, had an Ethiopian Miss Israel a few years ago. Three Arabs have served on the Supreme Court. There's an Arab party presently in the governing coalition in Israel. Jews and Arabs sit together on public accommodations and in restaurants. Yeah, that's, that's South Africa. That's what it sounds like to me. Jewish ethnic genocide, ethnic cleansing. Here's something for your audience. Everyone here knows it, so it's, you know, talk about preaching to the converted. Next time someone says the word ethnic cleansing, say the following to them, say to them this, say, do you know that the Palestinian population has doubled since 1967, since the quote, occupation, doubled, doubled? Ask the Cambodians, the Armenians, the Jews, the Congolese, the Tibetans, they understand, the Armenians, they understand that genocide is about subtraction. You don't get to double. You don't get to double your population and use the word genocide. It's an insult to every other group that actually experienced a true genocide. Fascinating. Um, Isabella, your hand is up. Would you like to ask a question? Sure. I actually would like to comment uh, if that's okay, or are we only asking questions? Can I make a comment? I think that's fine. Yeah. Hi, Thane. First of all, I, I'm a big fan of, of your work. I loved uh, the article that you wrote in Sapir over the summer. I thought Thank it was you. excellent. Thank and you. your conversation that you had with, uh, with Brett was really excellent, as is this seminar. Um, I just wanted to say, you know, it's a point I make often. I write a lot on Soviet Jewry and uh, the yes, anti-Zionism that Soviet, the Soviet Jews experienced. You, you, just so, had a long, you just had a long piece in Tablet, right? right? Didn't you? I had one in Tablet, someone. and I also I have one in Sapir, also in the current issue on this. Subject. Oh, that's right. That's uh, where I saw. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I just want to make a point for uh, for the rest of the participants that you probably are, are fully aware of that uh, 
all of these all of these ideas that we're hearing today from the left, uh, the anti-Zionist ideas, sound so painfully familiar to those of us who came out of that <laughs> culture. Mm -hmm. We heard all of it. Um, I believe that it was, uh, you know, it was invented there, and it, it's just a question of how it's being brought here. And unfortunately, it's very hard to defeat it with logic because it is propaganda. Propaganda is really hard to beat with logic. When somebody says that Zionism is racism, it's uh, it's propaganda. It's hard to beat with logic. It's, it aims at your emotionals and at, at your gut. But I also want to say that something that I, I, I've never written about but have thought about a lot is that this question of equity, you know, we also, Soviet Jews are also very well familiar with it because the Soviets really went at it in the 70s at reducing the number of Jews at the universities and other places in the name of uh, creating more equity, creating a more equitable society. So all of it is just incredibly painfully familiar. It's terrible to see it come to America. So thank you again. Thank you, Isabel. Thank you for your writings. They're really w wonderful and essential. So I think we've got, we'll have time for maybe one, possibly two, but certainly one last question. This is from Lisbeth. Um, and the question is this, as a Jew from classic liberalism, I voted against Democrats in the last election. After Obama, I was done. Is the only way to change the current course to openly challenge Democratic leadership? The only voice I ever hear doing this at all is from Rep Torres, South Bronx. Well, you know, the, the experience of the British Jews is interesting. I don't know what, how it ended up, but, but you know, Jewish members of parliament uh, left because of Jer Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, and so they left and they essentially started their own party. Uh, I don't know if that party still exists. I don't know if they have now rejoined the Labour Party. But I do think that that's one of the things, you know, th this is the thing that I've written about in my uh, essays for the Jewish Journal. There's no equivalent of the squad for Jews. You know, I, I mean, I, I, I look at people like Nadler and, and you know, Feinstein and, and uh, uh, Schumer, and I think, God, where are you on this? Why don't we hear from you? Why are you not a Jewish squad? Now, again, it may have something to do with the fact that they're white. And so therefore they're not in, you know, one of the things that intersectionality insists on, which I didn't discuss is the silence of white people, that they should shut the hell up and listen to people of color. You know, this is what the Jewish founders, the women who founded the Jewish March discovered. They were essentially told two things on the second meeting. They said, here's something you need to know. The Jews founded the slave trade. And secondly, you should really be listening to us because we're people of color. And I think that that's one of the reasons you don't see a Jewish squad because intersectionality demands that, that, that the people of color are just listening. Uh, if, you're, if you're a white person, uh, I'm sorry, a, a white person, you're just listening and you're listening to people of color who have the more important message to say. Um, so I, I don't know. All I know is that there, there aren't many choices. There is a progressive left, but where is, where would, where is the liberal, you know, the, the Democratic Party has confused liberalism with progressivism. They're very different. The progressives in American politics today are illiberal in every way. For everything, the reasons I said, everything I just said, that's the reason, they're illiberal. They don't have the first idea about the Bill of Rights. They don't understand anything about uh, the First Amendment. Uh, so, you know, the question is, who's standing up for liberalism? Who's standing up for cosmopolitanism? Is it the Democratic Party? I don't know. It seems silent to me on liberalism and cosmopolitanism. I just don't know. It would be, if there was a third party, that's something I would jump to. If there was a third party that stood for liberal culture and liberal values. We just don't see that and we've confused it. We've allowed the hard left to confuse Americans by thinking that that's liberalism. That's not liberalism. What they're peddling is illiberalism. Thank you. So um, maybe we have just one more quick question before we finish. And that was one from uh, Deborah, who says, does the Virginia election show that there is hope? Do you think that the other side has gone too far and people are starting to wake up? 
You know, I don't know. I was having a discussion with my friend Joey Feshback last night about that. He believes that's true. I'm again, I, I'm often wrong and, and I'm I'm cynical. I tend to think without the was it the Landon School uh, County School Board? Is it Lawden, Landon? I forgot what it was called. But without that school board, uh, I'm not sure that this election would have gone that way. I'm not saying that we should that, that the, the theory this should this shouldn't pick up momentum because yes, what we are seeing is a, a complete hostage taking of American education system. Education schools in the United States are woke schools. They they don't give you bachelors of arts. They give you bachelors of intersectionality, bachelorism of wokeism. Uh, that's who our teachers are nowadays. That's what they graduate. This is a this is an American crisis. You know, these are people that graduate from college and go to public schools and sometimes private schools with only wokeism in their mind. The only thing that they've read, the only thing that they know, is intersectionality. So I, I do think that it's it's good that you're seeing it at the local level at school boards, but I don't think people fully understand. How, how pervasive this movement is. You know, I used to think, look, my life is miserable at a university, but thank God it's only confined to the university. Well, let me tell you, the pandemic and Black Lives Matter and the George Floyd killing, that opened up the university. And now I can say to all of you, welcome to my world. Now that you've seen, now you've seen for the last several years, what life is like at a university. Um, so, I just think it's so pervasive at the local level. I don't know with whether what we saw of, you know, this revolution in Virginia, um, you know, whether it will pick up. I, I, I just don't know. I, I, look, I know this. In New York City, you have some of the wealthiest kids go to three or four of these private schools that teach this same nonsense, that have the same broad brainwashing, indoctrination, propaganda. And with the exception of one man from who took his daughter out of Brearley, all these high-powered Jews and non-Jews that work on Wall Street, that send their kids to Dalton and Trinity and Horace Mann and Riverdale, what are you doing? Why are you writing a check to these places? Why are you writing checks to alma maters that are so anti-Semitic, openly anti-Semitic? Why are you doing this? So, you know, in so many ways, it's not uncommon. Jews are oftentimes complicit in their own destruction. And so I just am too cynical to see the kind of counter movement. What we saw in Landon, is that what it's called, county, that school board? I would be very, I don't, I didn't see Jews in that group. <laughs> I just didn't see any Jews fighting back there. That just is, and I don't understand how in this city, where Jews are not shy, and if they had the wealth to send their kids to these private schools, what are you waiting for? Why is there only one Jewish parent or one other parent who's willing to fight back? Why are you writing these checks for something that is so avowedly illiberal, anti-intellectual, anti-cosmopolitan, anti-democratic, and anti-Jewish, anti-Semitic, and anti-Zionist? Thank you so much. That was saying that was wonderful talk. I'm afraid it's the end of the session now. Um, it's uh, four o'clock at bridge time. Um, so thank you so much. The recording will be Bye, everyone. Everyone will be able to see it. So thank you so much, everyone. It's wonderful to see you today. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you, Thane. Thank you, Max. Bye bye.